Okay. Welcome, everybody. I am here today with Rob McEwen. I'm excited to speak with him today. Uh, before I delve too deeply, though, as always, as the standard disclaimer, right? This is entertainment purposes, not investment advice. Uh, please read full notes in the YouTube notes below. But yeah, Rob McEwen, I'm sure he's no stranger to people who are listening. Rob is the chairman and chief owner of McEwen Mining, which has three producing mines in Nevada, Ontario, and Argentina, and holds 68% interest in the large Los Azules co copper project in Argentina. Rob famously was the founder of Gold Corp, where he took the company from a market cap of $50 million to over $8 billion, which I think is probably about everybody's dream in this, in this industry. He owns 17% of McEwen Mining, 15.8% of McEwen Copper. Throughout his career, Rob has been awarded numerous accolades to reflect the success, including the 2001 recipient of the PDAC Developer of the Year Award. He's a member of the Mining Hall of Fame and also is a member of the Order of Canada. So, Rob, again, I, I yeah, with, with great gratitude, thank you very much for taking your time. I'm, I'm happy to talk to you today. How are you? Terrific. Thank you very much, Matthew. Yourself? I'm doing well. Thank you very much. Yeah. So yeah. I think this conversation will be a little bit of, you know, a soup to nuts a little bit, uh, somewhat philosophical at times here. Um, I also, of course, want to talk about McEwen Mining, but I thought just because, you know, speaking with Rob McEwen, I'd love to have a chance to discuss with you uh, yeah, maybe just your history first, if you don't mind, right? So, I mean, maybe, you know, no place to start like the beginning. Uh, where did, how did you start out? Maybe what, what drew you to this industry? Well, let's just start there. Um, well, it was, I was introduced to the market in gold by my father, who has um, owned a broker, a stock brokerage firm. And I followed him into the industry. I had heard stories about investments and gold at the dining room table for a long time. He had me charting stocks when I was 10 and 11, and I made my first investment when I was nine. Um, and uh, I thought, well, that was an interesting time to make an investment. I made about nine times on my money. And I thought, well, that's this is an easy place to make money. It took me about 30 years to replicate Result. Um, and there are a number of times along the way stopped. Um, and then the mining industry, uh, I was exposed to a lot of uh, mining promoters, entrepreneurs that would come in. And uh, I thought one day, well, I'd like to jump into the same jet stream as they were. And so um, I jumped in in a hostile takeover bid. Um, beat away the hostile bidder um, and ended up controlling two mining companies and put money in exploration and Gold Corp became a very profitable company as a result of finding a mile below surface a very rich ore body. Um, and I continue to invest in the junior mining space, which is a space that's uh, provided we with some good profits and that those funds I've used uh, with my wife to invest in her philanthropic interests in regenerative medicine and leadership development, uh, architecture, and artistic uh, endeavors. <laughs> so. Yeah, quite a career, no. Uh, and I guess maybe the question I'll ask as a follow-up is, I mean, you have this, this long beautiful track record of, of experience and success, you know, and I, and I guess the question is at, at, you know, at this stage in your career, what continues to draw you? What, what keeps you active in this industry? Well, one, there's the excitement of a discovery. And um, right now we're working on a very large copper project that I think could provide a new model for the mining industry and help win the hearts and minds of, the broader public um, in that we're looking at approaching mining different than the way it has been done in the past. Um, probably a little more sensitive to the environment and creating, it's an industry that's essential to modern civilization. Mm -hmm. And most people don't give it that thought at all. But um, our our life would be much simpler and very primitive if mining were to stop all of a sudden, because it's <laughs> so much it's so integrated into our daily life, and it's also extremely important 
in the battle against climate change in terms of providing the materials to create the equipment to deal with climate change. So I think there's a big purpose there. And well said, I think that there's, there's follow up questions that I would like to follow up with, but I think I'll, I'll keep those for when I have them planned right now. But when you discuss Los Azulis and the, and the ESG component, uh, I think that's a, a large part of this conversation that I'm looking forward to. Uh, maybe just, you know, one final reflection here, just on your own, your own kind of past in the industry. Maybe you know, if we're looking at this from an educational perspective, maybe do you want to reflect on successes or failures, right? And more, more, more important than the individual event is maybe the lessons you've learned that you carry with you or continue, continue to resonate with you today? Sure. Uh, well, after my first experience investing in the market, um, thinking this was an easy place to make money, um, I tended to invest. I probably followed the herd and, ended up finding myself buying at times at the top of the market, which is the wrong time to buy. Um, today, I try to buy at the bottom of the market. So that'd be one lesson. When everybody is running in one direction to go in the opposite direction, and you can find uh, more attractive prices uh, that usually come back. Uh, the mining industry is very cyclical. so. Um, it's hard to get a situation where it's buy and hold for your lifetime. Mm-hmm. It's, uh, you need a lot of patience to survive the cycle, so you might want to just be in and out of a space. Gold, I think, is going to be, it has been important in the past, and I think it will continue to be important in the future, um, given the behavior of our government has been quite irresponsible the way they've uh, issued massive amounts of currency, all sorts of monetary stimulation, and they've uh, compounded it by taking on so much debt that our economies are very encumbered and they're stealing from the populace by through depreciation and inflation. People are going to be concerned about their assets. Gold's been a tried and true place to put your money. And you can look at the central banks today. They're, um, they've been the most active in 20 years putting gold into mm-hmm. their reserves, mm-hmm. which suggests to me that they, uh, they don't have as much confidence in fiat currency as they used to. Mm-hmm. And maybe we should, we should be paying heed to it. So yeah, not so much even necessarily economic issue as it is a sociological issue for you then, eh? There's yes. some overlap there. Yeah, no, very interesting. I think that is officially maybe a separate interview. So maybe next week or something, I'll get you back for that one. But uh, if you don't mind, maybe we'll transition down into more of the, the, the practical nuts and bolts. Let us discuss McEwen mining, right? And so, I mean, it's it's kind of, I mean, from my perspective, and I'll be, I'll be glib here, right? But almost kind of two companies joined together and, uh, that you have your, your gold producers on one side, and you on the other, you have your Los Azulis, I guess, which it is almost partly its own company, right? But maybe let's just discuss the precious metal side here. And, and I mean, not to put you on the hot seat or to, to kind of shake your cage a little bit, but there's been some cost overruns, uh, Fox <laughs> Complex and Gold Bar. I was just wondering, just because I think it's a good conversation, right, going through your finances, can you just discuss, you know, these cost overruns and where they come from and solutions that are in the in, in, in process for them? Absolutely. Um the past couple, past couple of years have been pretty challenging for our precious metal operations. Uh, we miss guidance by a wide margin. And so our revenue is much lower. Um, our treasury shrank to the point you had to do some financings, which um, people didn't like to see at lower prices. Uh, our share price got crushed. And it, I guess we hit the bottom um at the end of, about this time last year a little bit before um, and since then we've been recovering because we're starting to deliver at least at fox on schedule but i'm always bothered you know it seemed to be an excuse every quarter but um at gold bar in nevada there was a very heavy snowfall that affected ourselves and others in the first quarter and then that snow melted in the spring, and we had a flood 
in a high desert location for a gold bar. And you go, how do you get a flood there? I mean, I, I, I don't think it's happened before, in, not in my history, but for a week, the only way to get to the mine was by boat or by helicopter. Huh. Um, but this is high mountain desert. It's not supposed to have a lot of water. Uh, so that affected it. We changed contractors. Um, Gold Bar has to to make its um, forecast for the year double its Q, uh, first half production in the second. Um, and its costs are, we're looking at all in costs, they're saying around $1,700. Um, Gold um, Fox Complex is doing much better, mm -hmm. and it's looking 1300 all in. And July was running ahead slightly of what we forecast. Down at San Jose, which is run by our partner, Hoshfield, they traditionally have a weak first quarter. Uh, second quarter, they produced about 70% more gold than they did in the first quarter. And they've expressed to us their confidence that they're going to be able to deliver. No. <laughs> but I'm always skeptical of that. <laughs> it's five or six months to go and uh, stuff happens uh, as you go along. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And then in Mexico, we bought a, the uh, process plant. We thought quite um, well in terms of price and That'll start construction later this year, and but by the end of next year, we'll be in production there. Not large, but a, a reasonable cash flow generally. Um, mm -hmm. Don't anticipate needing any funds this year, assuming the price of gold stays where it is. We deliver, uh, which will be a pleasant change from the years before. So if you were to look at it, um, higher cost and not large mines, and at the moment, not large, long lives. Um, at Fox, we think uh, we're coming up with a plan. We figure we have nine years there. Um, at Gold Bar, it's about three at the moment. We're still exploring there. Um, and San Jose has been going since 2007. It's in a, an area, a lot of high grade, but very narrow. Um, Veins and Mexico will be a small, a small but positive contributor. Mm -hmm. And then we move to our subsidiary, Los Azules, which is a giant compared to any mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. And so I guess, I mean, and again, this is kind of down the list here, a couple of questions, but it, maybe it fits here decently as well. But uh, what is your, you know, you know, what is the strategy in terms of how you marry these two? Like you say, Los Azules, is, you know, is a quite a bit larger than, than your other projects. And how do you, how do you balance them? How do you marry them? I mean, is, I guess maybe the side question is that, is there still a planned spin out for Los Azulas? Maybe let's start there. There's a plan to finance Los Azulas. So I, yeah. when I looked at, um, Los Azulas became part of McEwen Mining back in 2012, when we merged two companies, U.S. Gold, Monera Andes, and Monera Andes had Los Azulas in it, as well as the San Jose mine interest. I always liked it, but then we went through a price cycle. 2012 was a horrible time to put companies together because <laughs> it was right at the top of the market. And we had to go down to 2015, bottom out, and then start coming up. So when we had the operating problems in the Q&Mining, mining, our treasury wasn't large enough to advance mm -hmm. Q&Copper. copper. So I decided, well, perhaps we should separate the two. Um, and the market has a preference for pure plays. So a pure copper play as opposed to a big copper project mm -hmm. with the parent having a weak treasury just didn't work. And Los Azul is a very large project that needs a lot of money. So back in the summer of 2021, I put in $40 million into McEwen Copper, the subsidiary, to get the program going for drilling and moving towards an updated preliminary economic assessment, and was looking for another $40 million. 
And I thought that'd be a piece of cake. You know, just I put up 40, someone else would do that. But it took about a year. And in a, a year, August, uh, a year later, we raised another 42 million. One of them was Rio Tinto, the number two mining company in the world. Uh, we were advancing it, and then in February and March this year, uh, Stellantis came in for 105 million, and then Rio came in for another 30 million. Uh, so we've been able to raise in it 267 million dollars in the last, oh, well, since last August, uh, and so that basically. Uh, Went allowed it to move forward nicely, and and I felt as we build its value, it's the McEwen Mining. I should correct you. I that was one of the edits I didn't do. We now have fifty two percent, not sixty eight, okay. as the <laughs> results of the February and March financing. So there's a large investment by McEwen Mining. And then I own just under 14% of it personally. So my hope was that it would lift the value of McEwen Mining and we'd be able to do, we've done one secondary out of McEwen Mining, which has allowed us to retire 38% of our debt. Mm -hmm. And I want to move to improving the balance sheet further. Mm -hmm. So. Um, Will we do a financing in McEwen Copper? Yes. When will we do that financing? There's some, there's still parties interested in doing private placements at this point before an IPO, mm -hmm. um, being that um, the project compares very well. And once we get to an IPO, there, there should be a large value bump. Sure. And that's, and I think you answered my question ultimately because it is this, I mean, I love Los Azulas. I mean, it's just one of those great projects. It's just fun to read about. Uh, and, and, and yeah, as, as, as it progresses over the next, you know, five or six or seven years through the PFS, et cetera, to the construction decision, just a question of, of, of what happens to your precious metals uh, production. Uh, but I, no, that's, no, thank you. I think that's interesting. So maybe we, I, maybe I will come back to Los Azulas here, right? I mean, I, I love it. It's huge. It looks like it's going to last almost forever, right? <laughs> or close enough for my purposes, right? I mean, cheap ASIC, NPV to CapEx ratio is pretty good, especially when you consider how much the value is going to be, uh, you know, overly discounted as time goes on in terms of NPV over, net, you know, 10 years or more. I mean, 10 billion tons, I'm just kind of giving the, the, the boilerplate numbers here because I just think they're pretty, pretty great, right? It's, I mean, to me, it's exactly the kind of project that's going to be, I mean, obviously a mine, but I mean, bought up by a major or, or major, major interest in it, right? And as you mentioned, $155 million from Stellantis. That's a huge, I mean, I think that's quite interesting. You see lots of automobile manufacturers with nickel. Uh, I can name you a few of those, but as, as you're kind of advertising on your website says, I'm not sure if I can name one investing in copper like this, right? Um, and so maybe rather than just kind of uh, saying to you all the things you already know, maybe the question I have for you, I mean, so updated PEA has plans for 100% renewable power, less water, less carbon, carbon neutral by 2038 with aided carbon credits, Maybe, you know, do you want to discuss to me the how and the why? I mean, how, how do you plan to become that sustainable? And let's start there, I guess, the, the how of that, if you don't mind. Sure. Well, on the uh, renewable power, 100% renewable power, uh, Argentina has a lot of solar and wind facilities. And they, uh, one of the large power providers has said they will provide us 100% renewable power. Um, so that's part of the process. Um, we were originally looking at Los Azulas and using a conventional approach to mining and processing the copper, and that would be uh, a crush, a grind, flotation, and producing a concentrate. Because of sensitivities of water usage, we decided to go to a heat leach process. So we've sacrificed some of our recovery um, and profits to um, go with a heat leach process, but we'll use a third less water. Um, it's probably a third the capital. Um, 
and uh, a lot less power. So that brings us down. And we'll, we're envisioning a mine that is a heavy user of electrical equipment, trucks and um, trolley systems. So that's how we get down to the low level of carbon emissions right at the beginning. And uh, then we start working on getting down to zero some by 2038. Well, we see that all happening there. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's a big project, and I'm very excited by it. I think it could provide a model for the industry that might help the general public embrace mining hmm. in the future. Hmm. And I think that's a, I think that's a conversation that I would like to pursue a bit here. Uh, our mutual acquaintance that connected us, Laura Stein, I mean, she was talking about Los Azulas, you know, schools and green energy and sports plexes and such. I mean, do you want to share with your, with me your vision a little bit about what that, what this will look like as it comes to fruition? Yes, it's a bit of science fiction for the mining industry, but it, it started when I got all of our engineers and uh, designers and planners together a year and a half ago, I invited an architect that I knew that was um, is very prominent in the green living sustainable building space. And I asked him to join uh, a session we were having for a couple of days and just talk about how he thought he might help us redefine the mining industry. Because the mining industry um, a lot of people uh, are quite repelled by it and repulsed. So and that goes right down to the number of students going into schools of mining, engineering, and geology. Hmm. And so we're facing, at least in the developed part of the world, a real crisis in terms of skills and labor. So you have a lot of people moving towards retirement quickly and not many new entrants into the market. So the thought was, well, how do we make mining, how do we rejuvenate mining, give it a new model, make it uh, look like a sexy growth industry? <laughs> and I mean, that's a tall order, but it's what we need to do. I mean, the mining industry is a very complex industry. It uses a great deal of uh, a great variety of skills from environmental to engineering to uh, you're going to be seeing AI coming into it mm -hmm. at some point, robotics. And so that is just true. And, and as I said earlier on, it's, it's quite essential to modern civilization. So we have to get, you know, I, I think if someone bought a steak in the supermarket, nice and plastic wrapped and that, and then they had to go to an arbitoire and see it, how, how it got to that state, they might become a vegetarian pretty quickly. Um, and, and mining has that sort of same image. Yeah, the sausage <laughs> getting made, eh? Yeah. Sorry, continue. So anyhow, um, so we're, we're going out and it might be considered pushing the envelope. But so what will our mine look like? Um, there's going to be a big hole in the ground. We can't get around that. Um, we, we're going to minimize the use of um, internal combustion engines for getting around. Um, we're going to build a accommodation that I wanted a place that was very comfortable, that was in somewhat regenerative, that is pleasing to work and stay in. Um, and so one of the artist's renderings is taking inspiration from the Incas and their terrace gardens mm. and building a terraced interior with hanging gardens, growing your own food. It processes its waste there so you don't have to haul it out of the mountains. Um, it would be a large, large glass atri atrium the one we're looking at right now is about a thousand feet long. 
it's terraced with rooms along there where you you're in a harsh environment but you're inside this glass filled atrium uh -huh. um, and there's all sorts of materials now that allow you to create large um, expanses of this type of situation you would have a hotel in it um, and we wanted to create a place that would make the country proud that would make people want to work there want to visit there um, and be very open with um, we're not trying to hide anything we want to show the process we're proud of what we're doing <laughs> I find that yeah very very interesting, and I think that I, I'm going to kind of keep keep picking away at this because I think this is a really yeah very very compelling topic. I mean, I do speaking personally here, I appreciate your attitude to ESG uh, in a sector that can get pretty cynical about it. And if I'm being fair, you know, some companies you know insincerely kind of staple it on after the fact, so I can even understand why there is some cynicism around it. I mean, but but I mean, more realistically, mining does have a, a bit of a checkered past, right, in terms of its impact on local stakeholders and environments. And so I I, I I I feel very much the same as you, where ensuring best practice these days is this like natural and necessary direction for mining, right, in, in terms of, of the future, right? And so you, you've already kind of touched on these themes. Maybe I'll ask you kind of to return to them and, and, and answer them in kind. But hey, you like you as yourself stated, it's a bit of a, a new look for the mining industry, right? I mean, for a company or for an industry, you know, solely concerned with ledger books. I mean, like any like any like any industry, right? But how do you how do you start to convince people that 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 sole focus on the ledger books uh, isn't actually the best business decision in terms of of how you approach ESG or how you approach local stakeholders? That that that's your approach. It ultimately is the uh, the superior business decision or business choice how what 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 sort of conversations do you have the difference from say twenty years ago or earlier is that local communities uh, and not so local communities have access to all sorts of information and their voice is much louder than it was back then. So in order to get the social license to build the mine in the first place, you have to satisfy a very large group of people that weren't there many years ago or were not part of the conversation. And today they are. So if you want to build a mine, you're, you, you could look at it and say, well, Here's the profitability if we just do this, but then you say, well, but there's a price that you have to pay mm -hmm. to build that mine. And if you can do it in a way that protects the interests of the local community and contributes to the local community in a more meaningful way, uh, they might accept you faster. And I think that's fair, right? It isn't just altruistic uh, efforts. There is a degree of, of self-preservation or something, right? Where you, when you, if you can get local stakeholders or local communities on on board, it makes that whole process just run so much more smoothly, right? I think that yeah. I think there, there, there's wisdom there, right? Absolutely. Um, maybe I'm going to ask you about just, I mean, yeah, losses. Of I just, I, I, I love, you know, just sinking my teeth into a good big project, right? It's just, yeah, it's fun, right? Um, and so I guess my question is, is kind of maybe it's a simplistic one, but I mean, what the heck do you do with a project this size? I mean, you know, it seems to me that you, I think you have almost triple uh, the, the the pounds inferred that you do in M&I. And so, I mean, is there a point where you kind of just throw your hands up and commit to production or do you keep exploring or how do you balance those, you know, how do you balance those two uh, two motivations between exploration and upgrading and infill drilling, et cetera, et cetera, to get a huge deposits and m and i or or do you just kind of give up and, and move to production and, and let it let it happen a lot of our exploration was driven to convert um, a good portion of our um, inferred into indicated and then uh, we the measures and we also we wanted to be um, very precise in the definition of our payback bit the first five years Mm -hmm. Want to make sure we get our money out and keep going, but um, and we do have, we are exploring to the periphery and beyond because these types of deposits 
are known to occur in clusters. Mm -hmm. So perhaps there's, in the wildest dreams, there's another Las Azulas just, you know, up the valley or on the other side of the mountain on the property we own. So that would, I mean, right now it's multi-generational. Uh, but I, mean, I, I don't know how long it could be, but it, it'd be exciting to see some of that. But a large part of it was driven just because we're moving towards a feasibility study and we just want to have um, a tighter data set. So our confidence level is increased from where it is today. And that's just classic exploration data and data acquisition. I, I totally. Yes. Will yeah. we ever see Los Azulas go public? Will we ever see it as its own beast? Oh, I think so. Yes, I'm yeah. plan, planning on that. Yeah, okay. And and so, I mean, I'm trying to pick my follow-up question here. I mean, I, I guess when is a fairly simplistic question, but maybe do you want to just, I guess, just explore or discuss the what are the, what are the, that's the decision-making process involved as to, in terms of choosing when? Okay. Well, when we did our first raise in August of 22, we thought, all right, we're going to have enough money to get us into this year, uh, and we should be doing financing uh, to ensure that we have funds to continue this process. Um, a lot of that, um, the background for the prospectus, we felt was going to be provided by the preliminary economic assessment that we thought we were going to have done in the first quarter. But it was published in June. It was just because there was more information coming in that we wanted to put in in some of the drill results. And in the interim, a couple of people came along and said, well, we want to invest. So that large investment, Stellantis and Rio coming in for the second time, we didn't need to raise any money. So now we have sufficient funds to take us around into almost mid next year. And we are getting ready to have the documentation we need to go public. But there are still parties out there looking to perhaps do a private placement before an IPO. So you could see there is a possibility there'd be another investment on a private basis before the IPO. Mm -hmm. and, and right now, this is not the ideal time to try to raise money. The, the interest has been pretty small um, in the general market for mining projects for the last, I don't know, six months. And then you're getting into, you start looking at it and saying, well, let me see, Argentina is going to have a federal elections in October, November. There's all sorts of talk about who's going to be the presidential candidates in America. So confusion there. And then you move into the holidays in late November and December. So you're saying, well, you're either catching a mark somewhere in November or you're doing it early in the new year. With, in the absence of a private, another private placement. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I mean, it kind of goes back, uh, that timing is everything, right? And I mean, obviously this is a, uh, not the same. I, I'm kind of thinking in the microcraft world where where good companies can can go belly up if it's the wrong time in the, in the cycle for their project, right? And so, you know, I think it's interesting that even on even company the size of McEwen still still sensitive to those swings, right? Those cyclical changes. Um, if we're not finished raising money. I mean, mm -hmm. this is a two and a half billion dollar project, um, and if we can keep de-risking it by saying, "All right." We've got all this drilling done, and we know precisely where we're going to make our money and get to get the recovery of our money. And oh, by the way, we we put an application in for an environmental permit to fill. Maybe we'll have that in our hands before we go public, and and maybe there's an agreement with the government uh, to do certain things, and all of that improves the confidence in them. Mm -hmm. Getting your ducks in a row step by step, eh? Maybe so what we have the luxury of having a good treasury rate. 
Yeah. And that, yeah, can afford to be patient. Yeah, that is a, a nice thing to have. Absolutely. Maybe just one more on Stellantis. I mean, that is a, that is a, a very interesting kind of update or very interesting development. I guess maybe a question around them. How, how have they been as partners? What are their expectations? I mean, do they want a board? Did they get a board seat or are they silent partners? Are they active? I mean, what's, what's their level of involvement on the day to day? Um, we have regular discussions with them. They have one board seat. Um, and this was the, as you said earlier, this was the first automaker to buy into a copper deposit. And they have production in Argentina. So they are, um, they produce about 160 to 180,000 vehicles a year. Um, they're going, like all manu car manufacturers, heavy into electric. They could buy copper from us in proportion to their ownership, which is about 14.2% currently. Um, and they would be getting a cathode copper from us rather than us producing a concentrate that has to go to a smelter, be shipped mm. to a smelter, processed, and then shipped back. So in country, they're also quite interested in seeing other industry in Argentina. So our copper could be used to for uh, producing copper wire that they could use and and help diversify the industrial base of the country. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to switch gears here. I'm trying to be respectful of time and not have this stretch too long. Uh, well, just a couple of questions. I mean, I think I'd be remiss not to ask you about you know your due diligence process while I have you here. Uh, but just in terms of education, uh, you know, for myself or for my viewers, right, I think that an, an informed investor base makes you know everything's better, right? I don't like watching anybody lose their shirt, whether from people with good intentions or from people with less than good intentions, right? In terms of companies, but if you had advice to offer people, you know, if we're, you know, you're as a developer of Los Azulas, I mean, what are, what are some checkpoints or check marks rather that you might suggest people look for to, to assess or gauge if a developer is, is progressing in a proper or, or positive fashion or, you know, both positive and negative, right? Maybe this is yellow flags about what they are or not doing or, or things that you can say, oh, they're doing this correctly. This is a good sign. Well, as I said earlier on, the mining industry is cyclical. Uh, it's like the uh, entire commodity business. Mm -hmm. There are times when it's in favor and it goes out of favor. Boom, bust. So you want to look at, try to assess where you are in the cycle. And then within any particular company where they're doing development, um, you have in the exploration stage, if you have a big discovery, there's all sorts of excitement about it. There's a belief that it could be infinite in size. Um, and then they come along with a feasibility study and all of a sudden, well, now it's quite defined and there's a lot of money to be raised and you're not sure about that. And then they have to build it and deliver on the promise. And the industry hasn't had a, doesn't have a good record for delivering on the promise, at least in the more recent period, um, because there's been cost inflation, there's been intervention by governments, there are all sorts of reasons. But um, there were a lot of big projects that went way over budget. So that's a lot of the decision was based, our finances are based on just-in-time delivery systems and mm -hmm. if slow customs agent or you have um, someone going on strike or some group going on strike and everybody else is sitting around on their butts waiting for their strike to end, but being paid for being on their butts. That can all contribute to uh, excess runs. So, and then, so it runs up on exploration news. It comes down when I was building Gold Corp. <laughs> I call that the Valley of Death. <laughs> and you try to, how do you get across that? We kept our exploration up at Gold Corp and maybe softened that curve. It didn't mm -hmm. go right down into the valley. And then you build, and are you delivering what you promised or are you delivering less? If you're delivering less, then the stock rolls over. 
but if you're delivering on time and on budget and as promised, then it can start lifting from there. So two cycles to work with. One, the economic cycle, and two, the cycle of the construction or from exploration to construction and delivery are two things to be very aware of. Um, I'd look at who's doing the promotion and, and what do they have invested in there? Do they have a boatload of cheap stock and lots of options? Um, where are they? Is that an area that you're going to be able to uh, realize your problems in? Does it have a lot of corruption or a little corruption? The place has some corruption. Um, and yeah, and, and what your risk tolerance is. Um, I tend to live in a world where it's I have fairly high risk tolerance and I buy into a lot of early stories. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not, a, not a good one to advise on that, nor should I be because I'm not a financial advisor. That goes back to you, the, the thrill of discovery that still kind of charges your batteries, right? So kind of interesting to, to see that. Yes. Do you have any, uh, you know, non-negotiables or deal breakers where if you see that in a, in a, in a land package or in a company, you, you know, thanks with no thanks and walk away? I haven't had any um, joy for a long time in Africa and parts of Asia. So for, I personally... Um, stay away from that. Um, many in my early career, I invested a lot in South African gold mines, and they had high yields and long life, and mm -hmm. they were attractive investments. But I haven't been there for a long time. Um, I think you have to listen to all the stories, or as many as you can, and sometimes the most you have to suppress your first impression sometimes when someone comes in to pitch and try to listen to what they're saying and what they've found. Because sometimes your first impressions say, go to the office right now. I don't want to hear anything more. They might be too promotional. They might just be uh, dressed to the nines and asking for a lot. And you just know that their GNA is through the roof. <laughs> And your money is not going to take them very so um, but they're the prospectors, the explorers they're in there they're they're in there they're scroungers, they're diggers they're they're looking for angles, and you never I can never not listen because someone is going to come up and discover some of the secret treasures of Mother Nature. And you just have to be there listening to stories. The message versus the messenger, eh? Yes. That's and I find that actually resonates with me as well. You know, I you know that that promotion is necessary. Too much of promotion is no good, and not enough is also no good either, right? There is a, a happy medium, I guess, a Goldilocks zone for that. But no, I, I kind of I, I find I assess uh, you know executives or, or or yeah the pitch in the same way where you know a little too promotional a little too slick. Uh, but then also on the flip side, I mean, I love a good geo that just has zero public speaking skills, right? That they just, uh, you know, very dedicated to their craft, very dedicated to the science of it, and maybe not at all promotional, right? And, and I think you make a good point. Being able to sift through that and, and actually get to the, the, the meat of the matter is, is the relevant bit. No, thank you. Maybe I'll circle back here just to discuss jurisdiction because uh, I think it's kind of interesting you know, you've got Nevada and Ontario, I believe, and, and San, I mean, Argentina, I know some people kind of raise an eyebrow, but San Juan specifically is a very strong mining district, right? But then, you know, Mexico, and then you discussed this now kind of uh, an aversion to other jurisdictions. What role does that play, right? I mean, to, so I, if I was going to, you know, assess Rob McEwen today, I would say that jurisdiction is important. Uh, but then also, obviously, you're, you're like you say, you still have a, a certain uh, appetite for risk or tolerance for risk. And I was just wondering, maybe you could just discuss or add, just add some color to that as you would. Well, in Mexico, um, we have been robbed there. Hey. And, uh, so, and there is a, a large criminal element in Mexico. Um, we had the asset 
and it had some potential. So I said, well, let's give it a try. Um, and then we bought this uh, process plant very inexpensively and said, well, we've got capital way down here. Uh, it looks like it'll be a reasonable cash flow generator. So let's go ahead with it. And, and it's interesting, the, we do town halls every month, virtual town halls. And I have to say the Mexican group is the most animated, the most colorful, the most participatory, participatory of all the, the groups that we talk to. Um, so they're very committed. They seem very happy to be working with us. And um, you want to uh, further there that involvement. Argentina was another property I bought, I like because of Los Azulas. And I thought the San Jose was going to provide us the cash flow to develop our other assets. Mm -hmm. It hasn't proven to be that all the time. We get dividends, but we haven't had a dividend lately. In other areas, it, it, it for us at least, while we were going through these operational challenges, we didn't have the bandwidth to go look at some other places. Uh, I think Northern Europe is a good place to be. Canada is, it has some difficulties just with communities. Um, and I think America is waking up, they're saying, all right, if uh, we're gonna cut China out of the equation, we yeah, better yeah. have all, our own minerals. And I think the politicians are a little slow to change, but it's dawning on them that um, we need to have this raw material, and uh, China's doing a very effective job of creating partnerships all around the world that might deny us access. Mm -hmm. um, so, so jurisdictions, I think, might change. Uh, there's a large reach by the State Department to go down to Latin America and reforge the bonds that have maybe been ignored. And so is, I guess, uh, I mean, it, it, I, I'm enjoying the conversation. I guess maybe if I was going to ask you just to pin you down for the sake of just my own, my own uh, edif edification as well. But so uh, where, what is my question around jurisdiction? I mean, how ultimately then are you, you can be convinced based on the pro based on the project, you can be convinced to go into non tier one jurisdictions or what's, you know, at, at what point is it, you know, too spicy for you, right? Or uh, how do you make that decision around what is too much jurisdictional risk? When I think anyone in the company's life would be at risk. Hmm. Yeah, I very well. Want, I wouldn't want to send them there. Hmm. Yeah, very well. Well, that's a, I think that's an acceptable answer. Yeah, thank you. No, very well, very well. Um, so Rob, I kind of, uh, I think this is actually kind of it for me. I thought maybe I'll just give you, again, thank you for your time. I've enjoyed this conversation. Uh, I thought I'd just give you final opportunity for final thoughts. Well, I, I've grown up in the gold industry. Some people said, well, why do you have anything to do with copper? And I said, well, you know, gold's a monetary metal and it, it's used to protect your wealth from all sorts of irresponsible governments. Hmm. And now we have copper being a critical component in the battle of climate change. But I always look at deposits through, if they're non-gold, I look through a gold lens and try to put them on a gold equivalent basis. Yeah. Yeah. So if I look at Los Azulas, I go, all right, if I take the gold price and divide it by the copper price, it takes about just over 500 pounds of copper to equate to one ounce gold value. And so I look at the 37.6 billion pounds of copper in our, you know, resource base and divide it by the 500. And it's equivalent to a 75 million ounce gold equivalent asset base. And then I look at the cost and it's at a dollar seven. So that works out to about $550 cash costs and all in at about 825. So I'm saying this is at the bottom of the cost curve for the gold industry. Mm. And then the first five years um, is equivalent to about 800,000 ounces of gold a year, um, low cost gold. And the next 22 years is at um, 
a little as 640,000 ounces of gold, and you're running for 27 years, and you're only using a third of the, the resource. Um, so it's multi-generational, um, low cost, uh, trying to protect the environment. I said, well, this is a big deposit. And what's that worth? So I think it's worth a lot. Well, yeah, and I, 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 the, that certainly catches my attention. 75 million ounce gold deposits. It's not bad, I guess. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> Some of two gold strikes. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I think I'll, I'll end it there. Obviously, uh, people, if anyone listening, McEwenMining.com for more information. I, I'm going to guess that uh, Rob is not a stranger to anybody here. Uh, again, Rob, I, I yeah, do thank you for your time. I appreciate that. Thank you for having me on my show. Thank you very much, Matthew. Have Bye. a good day. You too. Take care.